Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we'll be looking at the third in our series on GNU Plus Linux. And this time we're going to be dealing with the future of Linux. So stay tuned right after this. <laughs> I thought, you know, I thought that after, in, in when I initially started this, we'd be talking about flying cars powered by Linux and no. <laughs> No, that's not what we're going to be talking about, unfortunately. So, uh, to start with a quote from Yoda, the dark side clouds everything. Impossible to see the future is. And we're talking about uh, operating systems in general. So the last time we talked about the Linux server, Linux on the server being a success both in the web, in the cloud, IoT, embedded, supercomputers, yeah, it's definitely a successful uh, operating system in that vein, but it is being accessed mostly by non-Linux clients. And why would that be? So I, I have another reason besides the killer app why that might be, and that is when you try to be everything to everyone, you, you accomplish being nothing to anyone. And that was a quote by Bonnie Gillespie. So I want to delve a little bit into this question of whether or not we're going to be driving more and more of the operating systems to the cloud. Now, we've had virtual desktop infrastructure for some time. I mean, it's been around. It's not the same as when it started, but it's been around for, gosh, probably uh, at least 15 years. So Chrome OS came out and they made a kind of a different approach. They Here's a low-powered device that you can use. It has a screen, a keyboard, it looks like a laptop. Uh, and the applications that you have installed on it are actually accessing the web. So your applications are basically cloud-based. Uh, you can work offline somewhat, but they have limited amount of data storage. Windows has been working on Windows 365 Cloud PC for quite a number of years. I remember seeing it probably six years ago when they were first talking about it. And maybe it was earlier than that, but maybe that's the first time I heard of it. Uh, so yeah, not a big Windows guy, as you probably know. Uh, but they, uh, they went into GA, which is general availability of Windows 365 Cloud PC in August of 2021 where you could use any device to access Windows. And I don't mean that you're accessing your remote machine through the internet. This is different. What does this thing really do? So in the early days, you had to log into your 365 Cloud PC from your Windows desktop, but not anymore. Now you can boot directly from your device into your session in Windows 365 I believe that is a preview still, but it was introduced uh, last December. So uh, yeah, that is relatively new. I don't have any market data on how successful this has been because quite frankly, I mean, it's pretty new. I don't, I mean, it hasn't been a year's worth of use yet. So, but what about, what about people that are on Macs? What's Apple doing about it? Well, not a lot, but we do have some movement in that direction, but the first thing we'll see is Amazon's AWS has had a Mac OS cloud for developers since December of 2020. Now, that really addressed the Intel Macs. They used, uh, I think it was Intel-based Mac Minis, they racked them, and then if you wanted to have those available to you, you could rent space on it. Uh, they have expanded that in, last December, and again, I think this is also a preview so, um, and that was in December of 2021. Those are M1 Macs. So uh, it is powered, of course, by AWS Nitro Systems. So that gives you access to a lot of other facilities within AWS Cloud, uh, besides just being able to do development work. A lot more things that you can do there. So there's, there's also other companies that do Mac OS to the cloud. There's Mac Stadium. They've been around for a long time. Uh, they introduced Mac OS Cloud years ago, and they today they have both Intel and M1 Macs. Now I'm sure they'll be they'll be offering M2 as soon as there is a server type device that's available. So 
what did Apple talk about at WWDC 2022? Well, they didn't mention it in their keynote speech, but it is on the it is it has been mentioned on the developer side. So, uh, in WWDC 2022, they announced Xcode Cloud. So, starting for about fifteen dollars for a twenty-five uh, compute hours per month, and it, of course it ratchets up. You can get more hours. Uh, it offers you an Xcode development environment that is cloud-based. That is going to be free to all registered Apple developers till the end of 2023. After that, you'll you'll pay as you go for the service. So you don't have to have <clears throat> xCloud installed on your machine anymore. It also brings in a number of tools for the developer. But what about us? Well, so far, to be able to access you know our normal devices, we don't we don't yet have it. But you can see that there is movement being made here. Also, in May of 2022, this year, uh, Apple has decommissioned their old cloud, the old Apple cloud. That's no longer around. Uh, so they have migrated everything over to iCloud. So what about Linux? Yes, there are Linux desktops in the cloud. Uh, Amazon has workspaces for Linux. Uh, it, they also support uh, the workspaces for Windows as well. So it offers basically a Linux virtual desktop infrastructure, a VDI. Uh, I don't know what options they have. Now, Amazon has their own version of Linux. I don't know if it's one of theirs or whether it's Ubuntu. I have never messed with that. I do know some people that work for Amazon, and maybe they can comment on, on what the offering here actually has been. This has been around for a while. This is nothing new. There's also the cost. So what's the cost to have your desktop in the cloud? Microsoft starts their uh, Windows 365 Cloud PC at $31 per user per month. And that can go up depending upon what your <clears throat> processor needs are, your memory needs are, and your disk storage needs are. Uh, yeah, so they have offerings in all of those spaces that will allow you to pick and choose uh, to what you want. So. Uh, also, Amazon's Mac OS uh, cloud starts at about a dollar an hour on Amazon, and uh, Amazon Linux starts at around $34 a month. That's an estimate based on what I saw. What do I think about the Linux desktop? Well, we've been saying for years, I mean, there's people every year they say, oh, this is the year for the Linux desktop, and everybody laughs. Uh, and that's been going on for a long time. But... <laughs> If all of these other operating systems like Windows eventually migrate everything to the cloud and Mac OS starts to migrate everything to the cloud, Linux could be very well be the last desktop standing because we're not controlled by a corporate entity, at least not yet. And that makes it very difficult for somebody to mandate, oh, you were, you're going to take all these Linux distros up to the cloud. That, yeah, so... <laughs> It could make the year of the Linux desktop inevitable. It could happen just simply because there's nobody else there to occupy that space. Now, granted, the desktop market has been declining for Windows and Mac. Mac OS actually was going the other way for a while, but I think now they're probably declining again. So, so when do I think all of this might happen? Well, from what I've read, it could start as early as 2025, anywhere between 2025 and 2030. So somewhere in there, uh, yeah, it might happen. But, okay, so what about the Linux applications themselves? I mean, we, we know that Snaps is here. I mean, that is definitely a viable container that people are using, not only on Ubuntu, but it's been adopted by most of the major distributions. Flatpak, same thing, also been adopted by most of the major distributions. So these are basically containers around your applications. App Images, App Images actually has a pretty loyal following. It's just not as, it's not as popular because the App Images are physically larger in requirements for disk space than the other two. So, but App Images has some advantages and there's some disadvantages if you want to know more about it. I'll put a link to a video I did on this several years ago about all three of them. <clears throat> One of the real problems that we have is that we have all of these different spaces that we're trying to run applications in. We have desktop applications, embedded applications, IoT, mobile, web, 
and a lot of them have some of them have overlap some of them are the same application but they're required to be written uh, what five different ways in order to be able to handle the different screens now there are technologies that are available today to deal with that there are, there are frameworks that will take care of some of it and will help manage it but it still requires effort and code to do that some of the things that are coming in the next generation of course are things like flutter flutter allows you to build applications for any screen whether it's mobile web desktop or embedded flutter has the ability to manage those and then you end up with applications like this one which are flux Flux then it has the one application could then adapt itself to whatever screen it's running on. So yeah, so if you're running on a mobile phone, it can change the look and feel of the application to fit. Same if it's on a tablet and the same if it's on a desktop. But one of the more interesting ones is Maui Kit. Maui Kit builds applications for mobile and desktop. So that would be convergent, right? So I'm, I'm able to build an app that runs on mobile and desktop at the same, you know, the same app runs on both. It also offers cross platform. So I can run that app on Android or iOS or Linux, Mac OS, or even Windows. And it's based on KDE's and Kiragami. One of the OS's that, that is currently playing around with Maui, and they have a number of Maui applications is Nitrix, and I plan to do a review of this shortly, but uh, the Nitrix OS is designed around Maui, and they even have, what? well, let's talk about it. So the first is the Maui Kit. The Maui Kit allows you to build applications built on the Maui uh, API. So you have uh, the ability to display this in a number of fashions, whether it's going to a desktop or a mobile phone or whatever. So it, they're trying to get, now I don't know if it, you would call it right once run anywhere because you still have constraints for the underlying machine language. But yeah, it's trying to be able to detect the, the display and then change itself dynamically. So they also have something called the Maui shell. And under, my understanding is Nitrix has the ability to allow you to play with it. Now this is, a, this, this is still a prototype. This is not... The Maui shell is not a production release, but this one allows you to manage your applications like you would on a tablet. So, yeah, and and you have a number of ways of handling those. So it it's kind of it's kind of bringing uh, kind of a more modern way of looking at things. I mean, I guess you could look at it this way. I mean, if you're running GNOME. GNOME is probably I mean for a new user. If you're looking at a new user. It's probably not the easiest for a new user to learn because it's not something they're used to, right? It's not, they're, if they're coming from a Mac or they're coming from Windows and they hit GNOME, you got GNOME and it's like, wait a minute, this is kind of weird. Uh, but it, it, if maybe it might seem familiar, but then maybe it won't. Now KDE, on the other hand, does have something that's a little bit more familiar to the other two uh, desktop environments, but... KDE also has so many options that you can <laughs> get yourself in trouble with it. I mean, there's all other kinds. There's XFCE, there's uh, Mate, and all of those, which, you know, XFCE and Mate have kind of an older look to them. Um, Cinnamon has kind of an older look to it, too. It's a stable. It's very stable, and it's very quick. But is that really a, a, a user interface that somebody coming off of Windows 11 or Windows 10 might want to adopt and start to use. I mean, I, I don't, that's a rhetorical question. I don't have an answer for it. Uh, but, and then you have ones like uh, uh, Pantheon, which currently is kind of limited on the number of operating systems that it runs on. Something like this, uh, where if they're, even if they're coming from a web apps or they're coming from a cell phone, then they have something at least that is more familiar to what they are used to using. So I'm going to end this today with a quote by uh, Edward Snowden. Who among us can predict the future and who would dare to? The answer to the first question is no one, really. And the answer to the second question is everyone, especially every government and business on the planet, uh, because that is what the data of ours is used for. So, uh, and that that is a concern. I mean, if, and I think, you know, there's, 
cloud apps are, are great for simple tasks, but there are still some heavy lifter applications like video editing, uh, like uh, graphic arts design, 3D modeling. Even some application development can be heavier than a cloud app would be able to handle. Gaming is a heavier application than cloud apps can handle. Now, there's some that have been successful doing it, and there's some that have just been failures uh, because of the lag involved in it. So the desktop is still going to be necessary and it's still going to be needed because there's still these heavy, until we can shed these heavyweight applications and do everything in the cloud, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't see them going away. And maybe that's, maybe that's just the, maybe you guys have a different view and I'd love to hear what you think about it. But uh, yeah, maybe it's just my view and maybe it's just the old eyes. But uh, yeah, I don't know. But I think I like what, what some of these things are doing, uh, like Flutter and, and uh, Maui Kit. I'm going to kind of leave things there today. I hope you enjoyed this video on the <clears throat> third phase, the future of Linux. I think it's going to be interesting what happens. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine that Linux would go to the cloud. I mean, there, who would do it? Ubuntu? And who would follow? How many of people would follow? Would Red Hat and Fedora do it? I don't know. They might. Um, I mean, IBM is pretty big in the cloud. They, they're definitely, cloud is bre as some bread and butter on their plate. They, they do love the cloud, but they love the cloud for business applications and business services. I can't imagine that this would be totally different from them to take a desktop, a VDI application and push it into their cloud. Hope you enjoyed this video today. If you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again real soon. Bye for now.